Many years ago, I bought a cheap pocket watch at a junk shop in Chinatown. It was of the variety that needed to be manually wound, which at the time I considered an appealing trait. Upon purchasing the watch, I wound it up, and for the next day or so, I had a streak of monumentally good luck. Everything went my way. A girl that I liked agreed to date with me, the webcomic I was running got 15,000 unique views, and the lottery ticket that I bought purely on a whim resulted in me getting something like $150. Clearly, it was the watch. I was tempted to keep using it, of course, but I didn't want to wear out whatever charm it had. As such, I stopped winding it and resolved to only take it out when I needed a little bit of random fortune. Well, that was when everything went kind of downhill. As soon as the watch stopped, my luck reversed entirely. I wound up in the emergency room on the day of my date. The webcomics artist quit. My car's back tire blew out on the highway and the damage cost well over $150 to repair. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It was as though the debt of good luck that I'd incurred was being repaid with incredibly steep interest. Once again, I was sure the watch was to blame. Needless to say, the implications were astounding. If I was willing to steel myself against a potential calamity, I could be assured of having exceptionally good luck whenever I wanted. I might even be able to use the bad luck to my advantage. Unfortunately, things didn't work out that way in the slightest. Regardless of what I prepared myself to endure, the consequences of using the watch were always without fail of a nature that both completely undermined its own benevolence and left me off worse than before. Once while hoping to hear back about a job to which I applied, I wound the watch. Within hours, I received a call from an enthusiastic hiring manager who immediately set me up with an interview. When the day of the interview came, which was not long after I stopped wanting the watch, the bus that I was riding completely broke down. I had to take a very expensive taxi ride to my destination, and upon arrival, I was told that the position had already been filled. Since then, I've tried winding the wretched thing a handful of other times, and I've always regretted it. The price in bad luck is never worth the brief increase in good fortune. Someone once recommended that I simply keep the watch wound indefinitely, but what happens if I forget one day? I shudder to think about what could incur if I went through a week, a month, or even longer with nothing but good luck, only have the watch's hands grind to a halt. Perhaps my heart would stop with them. I'm not a superstitious man. I can think of several rational explanations for why my luck appears to change when I use that watch, but that hasn't stopped me from wrapping it in a paper towel and hiding it in the deepest recesses of my closet. To start off, I've been with an East Central Illinois area Goodwill for just under a year as of now, and I've been told of at least two ghosts in our building, and I've interacted with about two items that people gave us out of fear that they were haunted. I tried to buy the two haunted items, but a rule on buying merchandise made me miss the chance to buy them. The first of note was a magenta armchair, which was donated by a man who cleans out homes of elderly people whom have died or are being placed in a retirement home and the families have already pulled what they want or just want to get rid of the clutter. The man who will call Jim told me as I helped unload a small trailer of items, a family had an uncle pass away in this magenta armchair. Fairly good condition. Fairly good condition, but touching. Fairly good condition, but touching it felt strange. As he left, he chuckled at a joke saying the family saw the uncle's shadow around the chair, so they gave it to him to donate. I laugh and I tell him I'll let him know if I see anything. The next hour, I'm moving the chair to the furniture storage area and keep seeing a shadow in the corner of my vision. Not even an hour on the sales floor, the chair was bought after another elderly man sat down in it and just ripped the tag off and hobbled to pay for it. The second haunted item was a medium porcelain doll, because of course it was. To add a side note, the store I work at gets dozens of dolls like it a week, but only this one had something else with it. As a much rarer and older doll, it was in a protected glass box, and I joked at the family, so is the glass for our protection or the dolls? To which the mother told me the doll it was her grandmother's, and that it had a habit of moving the cloth that was covering it. So that night before we closed, I covered the doll to challenge the claim. The very next morning, we get a call from our security company saying a motion detector went off in the room with the doll, 
and the cloth had been turned roughly 90 degrees all around. We assumed it was mice, but our store had mostly non-functional cameras, so I can't verify anything. The last item is just as creepy and may have even added a ghost to our store, but I was off the day the incident happened, so this is just a recollection from who I talked to. One afternoon, an urn was donated in a box of other vases and pottery, except this one had ashes inside. As the box with the urn and vases was being moved by my coworker, we'll call Julie, dropped the box since she didn't have a good grip on it, and this ash went everywhere, including onto her. Quickly, they cleaned the ash the best that they could and tried to contact the family that donated the ashes, but I can't confirm or deny they were contacted. Just later that day, the urn and maybe 90% of the ash was taken away. I say 90% since during a deep storeroom cleaning, more ash was found under a row of shelving that wasn't properly checked. And as far as I know, they threw out the ashes thinking it was just dust. I'll have to ask about the other two ghosts when I go back next Tuesday. But I will say that I've heard some stories about both, and I'm pretty confident that I've seen at least one of them on the sales floor. Listen, I'm a skeptic. I've been a lawyer for the past 10 years and I'm about two-thirds of the way from being a licensed clinical psychologist in my home state. I understand Occam's razor and how simple explanations are normally best. I also know how impressionable people's minds can be, especially when disturbed or stressed. However, my family and I are having an issue and I just have no rational way to deal with it, so I'm looking for some advice. I'll premise this all with the following. We've lived in this rental for the past 14 months and haven't had one single negative issue other than having to confront a neighbor or two about loud music. Now, I don't even really know if I currently believe in anything involving the supernatural or even anything religious oriented. I have in the past, but not necessarily now. That being said though, I have an open mind. Nothing has happened here until yesterday. I'm a pretty big gamer in my spare time, which is not very often with a three-year-old and a pregnant wife. Yesterday I bought Resident Evil 7 for the PSVR, and there's been just strange crap happening ever since. I bought it yesterday around lunchtime, and then came home from GameStop. I had to leave again to get into my car to get into the shop for some repairs. I left the game at home while I was out, and the family stayed. When I returned home, my wife was on the living room floor crying. My daughter was fine, but my wife asked why I hadn't responded to my phone. Apparently while I was out, she and my daughter were watching some videos on the laptop in her bedroom when they both heard a gigantic bang in the living room. We have a gliding chair we initially used for getting our daughter to sleep when she was a baby. The chair had somehow fallen forward toward the direction of the entertainment center with my consoles and TV. There's just no way this chair would have been able to fall forward like that for no reason. No way at all. I tried to reason with my wife about it and come up with some kind of explanation. I thought that maybe my daughter may have positioned it in a funny position and maybe it just fell. Regardless, I wrote it off, but last night I was playing Resident Evil 7 late and I heard my coffee pot making its usual noises. Now, I had coffee way earlier in the day, but had it for some 10 hours or so. Our coffee pot always turns off by itself unless you manually turn it back, and then it will just stay on until turned off again. I absolutely did not turn it back on again. I was just sitting there playing with the VR goggles, and then it was on again. Still, I tried to just chalk it up to maybe one of us accidentally turning it on, which is a stretch. Today we left for a family outing, and I was the last one out of the house. I 100% for sure turned off all of the lights as I'm a stickler about such things. I know for a fact that they were all off when I left. Then when we got home this evening, the living room light was on and all of these so-called occurrences are just really messing with us tonight. I have an unborn child and my daughter. I hate to move, but I don't want my family in danger. I threw out Resident Evil 7 at my wife's request a few hours ago, but this is all messing with me very badly. The game is in the garbage bin out on the street. Could it be the object? Is it the house? Is it all a great big coincidence? Or is something attracted to one of us? I don't even know if I believe in these things, but I do know enough has happened to make me write this. Anybody's input would be immensely and wholeheartedly appreciated.
Thank you for letting me share my story. This story is about a Ouija board. Screw those things. Never again will I ever mess with one. My girlfriend at the time brought it in from somewhere, but I'm not sure where. We were young, right out of high school. We lived in a small crappy basement apartment. It was late in the evening when we decided to give it a go. We used it a bit, no big deal. Standard yes or no answers. After a while, the answer started taking a very dark turn. Whatever. Girlfriend is just moving the piece. Funny joke. Then the answers went from dark to downright bad. Threats and profanity. That sort of thing. Girlfriend is still moving the piece and acting all freaked out. Joke gone way too far. I know it isn't me moving it, so it has to be her. The joke isn't funny anymore, and we stop playing. I pack it up in its box, and I place the box on the table. My girlfriend sits across the room on a sofa, and I go to the bathroom. I hear a noise, and something fell on the floor. Girlfriend starts screaming and crying, and I return, and the box is on the floor face up. No way it could have fallen. Girlfriend says she was sitting on the sofa the whole time, and starts freaking out and panicking. My girlfriend puts the box on the floor. Joke isn't funny, and it's getting old. I'm pretty annoyed because I still feel like she's joking and taking this way too far. I pick up the box and put it back on the table. We stay up a bit longer then head off to bed. Girlfriend is still acting freaked out. I move the damn box to a high shelf. The box fits nicely and doesn't hang over. The shelf is stable and level. I put a small box of rolled quarters on top of it and push it to the back to weigh it down, just to be sure. We finally go to bed and girlfriend and I are alone and in bed together, lights now out. She settles down and the joke is finally over. Suddenly the box falls on the damn floor. We're both in bed, I get up. Box is now faced up, perfectly placed like it was on the shelf. The box of quarters was still on the shelf right where I left it. I decided to take the box out to my car and lock it in the truck under my spare tire. The very next morning, my girlfriend took back the Ouija board wherever she got it, and I haven't seen another Ouija board since. And I don't plan to ever again, and neither should you. When I was 16 years old, I found a yellow sheer fabric with outline of white fishes on it in my parrot's attic. It was summer, and my room tends to get hot, so I ended up using it as a blanket of sorts. My parents have no recollection of it or why it was in our home, by the way. Anyways, I remember one night as I was trying to look for it and seeming like it disappeared. I didn't really think much of it. I thought maybe my mom misplaced it when she washed it or something. A couple of months passed by and I remember and wondered what the hell happened to it. Well, as it turns out, my dad burned it. He said that one night he went to check on me and my sister and he told me that he looked at my bed and it seemed like no one was sleeping there. He then got worried and got closer to see if I was there. He said the more he got closer, he noticed that it looked like I was wrapped in pitch black darkness, which really freaked him out because my bed was against two big windows and I purposely had really sheer curtains so the moonlight slash sun would brighten up my room. But somehow with even the moonlight shining, I remained to look like just darkness. My dad removed the blanket off of me just to be sure I was passed out under the blanket. He said that he later looked at the blanket to see why the hell a sheer yellow blanket would do that. He said that the white outlined fishes didn't look like fishes at all. He described it looking like the skeletons of fishes with something inside the bellies trying to get out. That's when he decided to burn it. Honestly to this day I still don't know what to think about it. I guess I'm just wondering if anyone might have experiences like this. I'm not sure if the blanket was cursed, but my dad definitely thought so or he wouldn't have burned it. I really don't know what to think though. So I'm no stranger to the paranormal. A lot of people are scared of ghosts and all that, but it's never actually bothered me. I'm convinced I've got a ghost or two hanging around me, never malevolent though. They've actually helped me find things a few times keys or headphones or whatever. Well, I bought this handmade copper bowl at an antique store a while back. 
I used it as a plant pot for a while, and when I moved I ended up emptying it and it just laid around. I used it to hold candles I was burning so wax wouldn't drip everywhere. I got into a really rough spot mentally and I remember saying, if anyone can hear me please help me, and I tossed a coin in like a wishing well. Well, I started feeling better. I landed a great job, relationship was going well, and I was doing okay. I ended up just putting spare change in it. Well, I ended up taking out a few quarters for something and the second I did, I felt wrong. I left my house, slipped on the sidewalk, wind and weather suddenly turned cold. Something just felt wrong. So I decided to go home and put them back in and I instantly felt better again. I think I made some kind of offering bowl on accident and I don't know what to do. Ever since, I've been dropping things of material value in the bowl pennies or shiny buttons or handmade rings. I've tested it out a few times. Put a ring in, left it for a day or two, took it out and wore it, and something bad happened. Then put it back and everything was back to normal. It's like I've made an offering bowl that gives good luck when I feed it, but curses when you take an offering back. I'm not really afraid or worried about it, I just don't take anything out of it now, and I'll occasionally leave a ring or some pennies in it. I just figured this be the place to ask if anyone knows what's going on. In 2012, my stepfather overdosed on heroin and dropped dead in the hallway of his condo apartment. My mom had to move out shortly after since they were already behind on mortgage bills. A few months later, my lease went up and I was barely making ends meet and couldn't find a new roommate. My mom offered me the key to the condo apartment to squat for a few months until I saved up enough money for my apartment. I decided to take the offer and shortly after, I moved into the condo. After about a month or so, I was asleep in the living room and I had this weird dream about my stepdad. He was standing in the hallway facing the living room. He was just looking at me and smiling and laughing. He even made a stupid joke and everything. It wasn't that creepy at all, just bittersweet. Then I suddenly woke when I felt some pressure stroking down my head and back. There was nothing around me and it really tripped me out. As a very skeptical person that doesn't believe in the paranormal, it has to be just some kind of sensory hallucination. But it was still nice to see him in my dream once again though. It makes me tear up typing this. To my deceased stepdad, rest in peace. I'd also like to add a mildly interesting fact. He dropped dead on July 13th, 2012, which was a Friday the 13th. I live in a house that was built in the 1800s. It survived the two world wars and it's seen some pretty crazy things I imagine. One of the previous owners had two sons, who both took their own lives. A lot of strange things happen. The animals will wake up from their naps and follow something with their heads, just as they would follow me if I walk around. Also, before I switched rooms in the house, my brother had a room and he refused to sleep in there, as he said he would hear voices. He slept with my parents. He was a child. He eventually got my old room and since then he has slept in that room without any problems. There's also a whole floor we don't even use and I sleep in the attic. I have a motion activated light there that goes on as I'm walking the stairs to that unused floor. It would also switch on in the middle of the night sometimes, when nobody was walking under the motion detector. There's also some cold spots as well. When I was around 9 to 10 years old, I remember waking up to see a large shadow stood at the foot of my bed. I was living with my dad at the time. He has a very large house that was built in the 1800s. Every so often there would be an unexplainable event happen, such as footsteps when there was no one there, or hearing voices. On the night this happened, it was just my dad and I in the house, and my sister was staying with my mom at the time. I woke up and noticed the door to my room was wide open. I normally sleep with it closed. I then became aware of a large shadow-like figure watching me from the end of the bed. To describe the figure, it was around seven foot tall. When the figure noticed me, it seemed to melt into the floor and the door to my room slammed shut. Understandably, I was slightly traumatized by this whole experience. The next day, I decided to ask my dad if he was in the room 
and he denied any knowledge of the event. A lady who had two husbands died on her in the same house. That's the very same house that my dad decided to buy. The first one hung himself from the rafters in the garage, and the second one fell ill and died in his bed in the basement. I lived in the basement room and often just felt like I was being watched all the time. The bedroom in the basement has a secret storage room behind a bookshelf with a locking latch. I would always wake up to find the door wide open, it happened so often that I would wake up cold and I would routinely go shut and lock the latch of the door in the middle of the night. For the longest time, I thought it was my dad or stepbrothers messing with me, but it wasn't. My stepbrother lives in that room now and he says it still happens to him and that he's even seen it open on its own before. I'd also like to add that there's no air vents or anything, so I've ruled out wind. Also, in the garage, I always see light coming from under the door through the crack, only to open the door to pitch black. I've heard a lot of sounds coming from the garage only to find saw blades clanging together and slightly rotating in their place on the whole storage wall. I didn't really think anything of it at first, but when you find things moving all on their own on more than one occasion, it makes you look over your shoulder at the rafters and wonder. Me and my family moved from the US to the UK, and our parents bought an old beat up house. It still had lead pipes for the water. A nightmare all on its own. Anyway, work proceeded on the house whilst we lived there. We started seeing bright lights in the corners of rooms at night. Footsteps on floorboards. The house had carpet. I was about six years old at the time and started getting woken up in the night by a little girl. She would dance on my chest of drawers for me. I was totally creeped out. My mom just passed it off as me dreaming. The workmen who worked on our house also complained. They said that things would happen like their tools being moved and an odd feeling like being watched. After about a year of this, one of my eldest sister's friends stayed over for the night. She woke the whole house up screaming, saying a little girl had been in her room. She had apparently pulled her from the bed, and that's when she woke up. That friend left the house and refused to ever come back. My mom had finally decided that maybe she needed to do something about it and get some advice. It was suggested to my mom and the whole family that we should treat the presences as part of the family. So one day when we got home, we shouted out very loudly, Hi, we're home. Did you have a good day? Slowly over time, the house settled and we didn't get any more trouble. We also found out that a little girl did die in the house of asthma. To this day, my parents still live there and it's a beautiful homely place now. My uncle's house out on a very eastern part of New York was said to be haunted due to the family that had used to own it in the 1800s decided to not give it to the stableman and sold it instead. He and the maid were said to have haunted the place. We always used to joke that you would hear people or things moving around at night, but since the house is so old, we used to just laugh it off. My uncle's friend had her and her sister stay over at the house one night, and the friend had noticed a maid bringing towels down the stairs when she woke. She saw the maid again bringing what looked like a percolator down the stairs. She was so impressed by my uncle hiring staff. She eventually went back to bed and woke up later downstairs to see my uncle and his friend just chatting. She had asked where the maid went and she thought that the maid was cooking breakfast for them. My uncle had no idea what she was talking about and asked what she looked like. The sister explained and then he laughed. He walked her into the living room and pointed to an old picture. She then told him that that was the woman. My uncle replied, Yeah, she's been dead for about a hundred years. So I used to live in a really big house by myself. I was there as a hiring perk and took to look after the place for my boss who lived out of state but owned the home. One of those win-win situations. The first couple of months I lived there were fine, but when winter came, I started hearing things coming from the second floor. It started with little bumps and bangs coming from above where I had my computer set up and progressed to distinct footsteps coming and going across the second floor. 
I had been up to the second floor to check up on it from time to time, and I knew that there were unfinished areas up there. There was one place that always stuck out, an unfinished room that was sort of a walk-in closet for one of the upstairs bedrooms. It was attached to the garage attic. When I went up there to investigate the noises, it was open. I shut the door and locked it. Two nights later, there were more noises. Footsteps leading from unfinished room to the bathroom, then nothing. The worst part was the door. The door that led to the unfinished room would not stay closed or locked. I tried everything. Eventually, I decided to just push the bed up against the door to keep it from opening. That seemed to work. A few months went by without the door opening, but I would find it unlocked all the time. As some time passed, I would hear noises all over the house. Mostly just footsteps, but the occasional thump with no explanation. I cannot begin to explain how creepy it is to hear little taps up and down the hall from the other side of a bathroom door during your morning shower. I eventually moved out, but another employee moved in to take my place. His stay there only lasted about a month. The story that he told me is that he was shaving one morning before work, and he heard a slam, like someone dropped a heavy stack of books right outside his bedroom door. Then he heard heavy footsteps like someone running down the hall. He won't stay there anymore, and no one in the company will live in that house. When I was younger, I used to take naps upstairs, but by the time I was eight years old, I absolutely refused to go upstairs. The upstairs had two large closet slash attics. They ran from one side of the upstairs all the way to the other side on both sides. It was essentially a crawl space that was maybe about 30 feet long. It all started one day when a friend and I went crawling from one side to the other with flashlights, like kids normally do. Then, I saw a girl sitting there in the corner acting like she wanted to play with us. I know a lot of people say that whenever they see a ghost, they aren't scared, just interested. But nope, I was beyond creeped out. This girl looked normal. She had blonde hair, a nice dress, and seemed friendly. I stayed silent, kept crawling behind my friend, and got out of the closet. I told him what I saw in there, and he said he didn't see it, but he felt like he didn't want to go back in. My parents would occasionally send me upstairs to get something, and whenever I would go up there, I would always see the door swing wide open. It was as if they were trying to get me to come inside. I would always lose toys and wouldn't be able to find them anywhere. I remember my parents would be fishing out Christmas presents out of the attic, and we would find some of my toys in there. I remember being eight years old, my parents are still asleep in the morning, and I leashed up my dog to go take on the monster in the attic. I'd like to add that my dog is usually fearless and up for anything, but at this time she absolutely refused to go off to the top step into the attic. My parents never believed me with all the weird things that happened in that house. I would always get blamed for things that happened all over the house, leaving the lights on, toys all over, things that I absolutely knew that I didn't do. Well anyway, we move out of there when I'm about 10. Not a week passes before the new owners call us up and ask us if the house is haunted. Their daughter sleeps upstairs, and she says that she's been playing with a blonde-haired little girl at night. My parents just laughed at how crazy these new homeowners must be. To make an already long story short, the girl started appearing in other parts of the house for them. They would look over while watching TV and see the little girl sitting on their daughter's lap. They decided to look up on the computer the past owners of the house, and they found an old dressmaker that used to live there, and yep, a picture of the little girl wearing one of the ladies' dresses. The family that moved in there were absolutely torn apart by the events. They ended up getting a divorce, and the dad stayed living there in the house. Well, he ended up taking his own life in that very house. I lived in a haunted house for about 10 years. I had five kids while living there. Every one of my kids saw the man in the hat on the wall and they all saw him between the ages of two to five. Right around the time all of my kids turned six, they stopped seeing him. Once I heard my son screaming for me in the middle of the night, I went to him. He was five years old, and he begged me to make the drawer stop. I said, stop what? I asked him what he was talking about, and he said they keep opening and slamming shut. He couldn't sleep because it was too noisy. Things got moved around all the time, and lost all the time as well. 
The spirit didn't like babysitters and would torment every single one. The most violent episode was when I let my 15-year-old brother watch my kids. We got home around 2 a.m. and we found my brother sitting on the steps in the hallway between the front door and the kids' bedrooms and he was shaking and crying. He said that when he got the kids in bed, the pounding had started. It was everywhere, all over the house. At one point, it was so bad that he said he went outside to see if there were people outside hitting on the house. There was no one there. He had gone out the back door to check, and when he walked back inside, he saw the reflection of someone in the mirror walking up the steps to the kids' rooms. He then went running, thinking that someone snuck in when he was outside. He checked everywhere in the house, and there was no one in the house. But when he got upstairs, he said he saw a shadowy-like figure streak around the corner of the steps. He heard the front door open and shut. He then went running down the steps, but the door was closed and locked. He then proceeded to spend the next three hours chasing the shadow and hearing the doors open and close. After that, he never babysat for us ever again, and neither would anyone else. I remember having light shatter above our heads, and my children would laugh and talk to people in their rooms. We had neighbors call us all hours of the night asking if we were okay because they saw gangs of people in our yard sneaking around our windows. The cops got so used to getting the same 911 call that they stationed a cop to keep an eye on our house. There's so many more scary stories and nightmares that I had while living there, and it was super creepy. We eventually moved out, and the people that moved in after us only stayed for a month. They said it was too scary for them. The house has been vacant for about eight years now. So my husband and I rented a really old house. We had to fix it up a bit before my son came home from the hospital. He was very premature. He was in NICU for almost five months. We took down the wallpaper and painted, took down the popcorn ceiling, the whole nine yards. The basement was very unfinished and vandalized by teenagers. They were the residents before us. There was swastikas everywhere. We didn't bother finishing it because we didn't really need the room. I only went down there about once out of the year that we lived there. I always got a creepy feeling. It was like someone was watching you and they were angry. Sometimes that creepy feeling would come upstairs. I would give it about a week or so thinking it was in my head and then I would sit in the car with the baby while my husband burned sage to clear it out. He said that the feeling while he did so was really heavy, very angry, and he would see figures coming at him through the smoke. There were countless experiences there. The two that stick out in my head are as followed. One, I was taking a shower and the baby was in a little bouncer seat in the doorway. I open up the curtain and just as I do, a can of air freshener that was sitting on the back of my toilet goes flying towards my baby. If the door wasn't just slightly shut, it would have nailed him. I went full on crazy and I started yelling at them. I then yelled at them that if they're going to mess with anyone, mess with me, not my baby. He's just a baby. As I'm doing so, the detachable shower head I had went flying off at me, hit the end of his rope and swings down. Shut me right up. And the next thing. My husband and I were in bed, my son in his room right down the very small hallway fast asleep. We had a baby monitor because he was on oxygen, and therefore on a pulse ox monitor, so I wanted to be able to hear his alarm go off. So my husband and I were laying in bed together. We usually will talk for a while and say our good nights and then fall asleep. We say our good nights on this particular night, and not even five minutes later, we both hear clear as day a little girl laughing in the baby monitor. My husband jumped up out of bed ready to see what the heck that was, but I already knew no one was there. I was stunned. I literally couldn't move until I finally fell asleep. I do not miss that place. Not one bit. I have lived in two haunted places. The first was a house that we lived in for a short while when I was 12. We heard what sounded like rats running across the attic every night, so my mom had the exterminator set out a ton of sticky traps. We never even caught one bug. Then I would wake up with random injuries a few times per month, like I would get scratches, and I'd like to add that my nails are short. The final straw was when I woke up with what looked like a cigarette burn on my face. Thankfully the scar has faded, but it was very upsetting. We sold the house and got the heck out of there. Now for my next one. 
When I was in my mid-twenties, I lived in a haunted apartment. These spirits were nice though. I lived alone in a fourplex where my direct neighbor was never home and the downstairs neighbors never made noise at night. I would always hear people whispering in my hallway nearly every night. At first, I would always get up and look for the source of the voices. The parking lot was still, nobody outside in the courtyard, and the neighbors were either gone or passed out. This happened every night. Finally, I would just say, Hey, can you keep it down? I'm trying to get some sleep. And the voices immediately stopped. Every time. They would also open up my blinds in the morning before they thought I would be awake. There were a few times where I woke up early on my day off to go to the bathroom and I saw all the blinds in my living room wide open. I was pretty perplexed, but when I came out of the bathroom a few minutes later, they were all closed again. This happened pretty often. Here's my next one. A random happening that was the scariest thing ever. My husband had died and I had him cremated. I was still very young and had no children, so I moved on after only about six months. My now new husband had just started staying over at my place when the weird stuff started to happen. I began to see a shadow person in the mirror on my wall. Then one night, my clock fell off the wall. I also experienced this awful sleep paralysis and saw the shadow person again. I have never been so scared in my entire life. I finally made the decision to spread the ashes of my deceased husband, and after I did that, everything stopped. My deceased husband was a very mean man. He actually blamed me after his friend did some very awful things to me, and he eventually took his own life by not taking the insulin for his type 1 diabetes because he was trying to spite me for kicking him out. I should have just known that he would haunt me once I moved on. I'm not exactly sure what to believe since a lot of the paranormal occurrences happened to my dad, but I definitely saw and heard a lot of creepy things while living in a house in my teens. We'd very frequently just have a sense of anxiety and foreboding in the house, which on its own isn't paranormal, but certainly made it very uneasy staying there. I remember reading somewhere that radon exposure can cause anxiety, and the house did have a radon problem, so maybe that could have been it but I would also hear footsteps around the house when I was the only one there. I just constantly felt like someone was watching me. My dad got the worst of it. He claimed that he could hear sounds coming from the basement at night. I never heard it, but I'm an extremely deep sleeper. Then, the traditional slams, bangs, and crashes throughout the house. My dad also claimed that he would hear knocking on the cellar door. Sometimes he would hear a woman screaming. Supposedly, every family who had ever lived there had also experienced something creepy. There are three distinct things that stand out. The night before we moved out, my dad claims he woke up because he felt a sudden hard tapping on his head. My brother's girlfriend was staying over, and my dad and me were gone. We came back to find that his girlfriend's daughter was terrified because she saw a shadow in the corner of the room. I just chalked it up to the kid's imagination running wild. One time, my dad was practicing with his band in the basement and was expecting me back from a Christmas party. He claims that he heard very heavy footsteps from upstairs and he thought it was me, so he went upstairs to greet me, but nobody was home. I then got home about a half an hour later. It actually got to the point to where my dad had the house blessed. The priest was actually terrified to go into the house at first. This was right around the time that I was becoming an atheist, so I didn't really believe in any of that but I definitely experienced the uneasiness and occasional random noises, but I never experienced any of the screaming or knocking that my dad claims to have heard. At one point, we actually had some people from TAPS visit us and do a sweep of the house. They're actually associated with, but not on the Ghost Hunter show. We got some of the obvious orb pictures, which both me and my brother thought were really dumb. But at one point, being a bit of an edgelord thinking I had psychic powers, I told them to take a picture in one specific spot. The result was of an image of what appeared to be a ghostly bust of a person with a demented face. We tried to just explain it as a reflection from the washing machine, but it looked way too much like an actual person. I guess we'll never really know or have any answers, but that was a very creepy time of my life. A few weeks ago, I had to travel from the outskirts of my city into the downtown for a job interview. The process took all night long, and the employers kept asking for more and more paperwork. 
I had just moved and not all of my documents had arrived in or been renewed yet. Eventually it got to the point where I couldn't even proceed in the hiring process without more documentation and I had to leave the office blocks and go back home in the middle of the night. Understandably, I was a bit annoyed and the situation wasn't helped when I got to the subway station and saw that one of the tracks was under maintenance. The train was delayed and it would be coming in late. Irritated, I sat down on a concrete bench and started idly looking through my phone, as one often does when bored. The station that I was stuck in was not one of the nicer stations in the city. It was located directly on the onset of the inner city, and because of its fairly inconvenient location, it was almost always empty. Tonight was no exception, and I was the only person in the entire underground. About a minute into my waiting, I heard footsteps coming from the other end of the station. As they drew closer, I heard muffled conversation and eventually saw an old First Nations man shuffling down the stairway from the above ground station. He was speaking on the phone. I'm not sure if he was homeless, but he looked rough around the edges and had clearly seen his fair share of the streets. Not wanting to stare, I returned my gaze to my phone but kept a conscious ear out for the man. As unpleasant as being alone in the night is, it is far worse to be alone with a single stranger. As I listened to the man's conversation, I began to realize something. He wasn't speaking English, rather his conversation was in Cree, one of the local indigenous languages. I study linguistics and I naturally found it fascinating to hear aboriginal languages being spoken conversationally, on account of it being an extremely rare thing to hear outside of reservations. So, not looking up from my phone, I turned my hearing into this conversation ever so slightly more. Although my knowledge of Cree is minimal, I nonetheless immediately noticed several bizarre characteristics of this man's speech. It's difficult to explain exactly, but it sounded as if he was constantly changing his tone of voice and emotion. One second, it sounded as if he was speaking to an old friend, and the next he would switch tones completely sounding grave and serious, as if he was speaking to his boss or a figure of authority. It was a subtle enough change that I didn't initially notice it until I started listening in, but once I did notice it, it was impossible to ignore it. I've never heard anybody speak like he was, let alone without once changing the volume of his voice. I checked the station clock, four minutes until the train arrived. The man's conversation seemed to be slowing down and his replies became shorter and gruffer, down to the point to where they just became one word utterances, as if he were confirming a list. He paused for a moment and then clear as day said something he had no right to say. Well, he said my last name. As a note, I have an extremely uncommon and difficult to pronounce surname. I've since looked at several independent national census reports and they all seem to indicate that there's only about a dozen people in the entire country with my surname. And at that, they're all located on the opposite side of the country, over 3,000 kilometers away. I am the only person with my surname across this entire range. I should emphasize as well how perfectly he pronounced it. I can count the number of times that somebody has correctly pronounced my name the first time on one hand, but this guy nailed it even down the aspirations. I know that what he said wasn't a word in Cree either, as I've since spoken to one of my linguistics professors, and he's told me that my surname is a phonological impossibility in Cree or any other Algonquin language. I was absolutely bewildered when I heard the man say it. There was absolutely nothing on my person that had my surname printed on it. All of my documentation was in my breast pocket under two layers of clothing. I didn't know how to react. It felt as if my entire reality had started to spin in circles. I fought against my urges to look at the man. I almost felt as if if I looked at him, this whole situation would become real. His conversation continued without missing a beat. A few minutes later, the train arrived. I got on immediately and sat in a carriage across from a transit security officer. As the train pulled out of the station, I glanced through the adjacent window at the man, still standing in the underground. He looked up at me for the briefest moment before going back to his phone call. On the ride back, I had almost calmed my heartbeat before I realized something. The train that I was riding was the only train that was going to that station that night. The other track was under maintenance and nothing would have come on it at all that night. If he wanted to catch a train, there was literally no other option than to catch the train I was riding, which he very deliberately didn't do. 
Then I realized something else. I had seen the man enter into the underground through the staircase from the above ground shelter. Not only was the above ground shelter warmer or more spacious than the underground, but it had another advantage as well. Cell service. If he wanted to make a phone call, why did he leave the warm quality reception of the above ground to make his call in the cold dark underground if he didn't have the intention of catching a train? And why did his phone call contain a name that belonged to only one person in 3,000 kilometers? I know this story isn't as creepy as most, and it's not your typical let's not meet, but it really creeps me out, and I guess I'll never know why he said my name. The story happened about two weeks ago. My name is Amanda and I'm 16 years old. I was at a bus stop after spending the day at my friend's house waiting to go home. I was sat down scrolling through Instagram on my phone as I waited. I looked up now and then to check to see if I could see my bus coming and to see if anyone else was around the bus stop. The one time I looked up, I noticed a man across the street looking in my direction. He was staring at me, but I didn't think much of it at that moment, and carried on looking at my phone. After about two minutes, I looked up again to see the man still standing there, still staring at me. I was thinking this is weird, but I tried not to pay attention to him and hoped my bus would turn up soon. After about three minutes of nervously looking through my phone, trying to ignore the strange man, I glanced up a third time to see that he wasn't there anymore, and I let out a small sigh of relief. Five minutes go by, and someone tapped my shoulder. It startled me, and I turned around to see that it was the creepy guy that had been watching me. He spoke and then said, Hey, do you got a light? With a bent cigarette in his mouth, also grinning with his yellow teeth. I said in a nervous reply, Uh, no, I don't smoke. His reply back was, <laughs> I bet you don't, and let out a quiet chuckle. I didn't know what to think of that, but he was making me uncomfortable now, and even more than he was before. He stood by me at the bus stop and proceeded to light a cigarette with a match. I thought, why did he ask me for a light if he had matches the whole time? Was it just some excuse to talk to me? About a minute passed by until he spoke again. Whilst smoking, he then said, You know, it's been a long time since I had some good tail. He took another puff of his cigarette and then said, Yep, you'll do just fine. He threw his cigarette on the ground and turned towards me. My heart was beating out of my chest and I was breathing heavily, going into flight or fight mode. When my bus lights pulled up around the corner down the street, the man saw the lights and then ran off. I waved the bus down in a panic. I was so scared for what could have happened to me. Thank God my bus turned up when it did. Me and my wife Claire were on our way to Rotterdam for the weekend to visit her family, as it was her father's birthday. We live in Brussels, so the drive there would take around just over two hours or so, but we left at about 9.30pm because I get home from work around 9 and my boss wouldn't let me finish earlier, which means we would get to Claire's parents' house later in the day than we would have liked. But her parents usually stay up late, and as it was her father's birthday weekend, they probably would be awake celebrating, and it wouldn't be a problem. About an hour into the drive, we decided to stop at a gas station to refuel the car and get some coffee. It was dark, cold, and pouring with rain, so we didn't want to take too long. Claire went inside to get some coffee, snacks, and use the bathroom and pay for the gas. As I was putting the gas into the car, I noticed a strange-looking man in the short distance. He was staring very intensely at my wife as she walked into the gas station, but what bothered me more was how odd and how out of place he looked. He had no car or people with him from what I could see. He had long stringy hair, bad trim scruffy beard, and he was only wearing blue jeans, a white tank top, and trainers on. I thought it was crazy as it was January and freezing cold with the pouring rain. Why was he here at a gas station at this time far from anywhere and barely clothed for the current weather? At the time, I was thinking this guy must have been out of his mind. I tried to ignore him and look elsewhere as I wanted to avoid drawing attention to myself from this strange man as much as I could. But not long after, I decided to look back to check if he was still there, because I was very much distracted and unsettled by him, and couldn't look away for long. But when I looked back, he was gone. I was very relieved, as I didn't want him staring at my wife Claire when she came back. 
Just as I was thinking that, I heard a pst behind me. It was him. The creepy guy that was staring at Claire was now staring at me and smiling. He looked so much worse up close, so tired like he hadn't slept in years. He had horrible crooked yellow teeth and scars across his neck. His jeans were ripped and muddled and his trainers had holes in them. I just froze. I was startled and was thrown off by a sudden appearance behind me and then after an awkward moment of intense silence, he then spoke. He said in his gruff voice, Your wife. Then he leaned closer and he smiled awful like he hadn't bathed in months. He then said, I want to take a bite out of your wife. Not just a bite though, a nice juicy bite. And then he grinned a smile from ear to ear showing his vile teeth once more. At this point I was ready to have a physical confrontation, but after that he turned around and walked away laughing and talking to himself. I quickly finished putting gas in the car and jogged into the gas station and made sure Claire was safe. I then walked her back to the car. As I entered the station, she was just finishing paying for gas and the snacks. She turned to me and said, Hey, what's the matter? You look like you've seen a ghost. Are you okay? I told her about the creep outside, but I'll tell you about it when we're back on the road. Let's just go. We got back to the car and started to pull out of the station and make our way back on the motorway. Just as we're leaving, I looked in the rearview mirror to see that the creepy guy is standing in the road in the rain, just watching us watching us and laughing. I told Claire about the man and the encounter that I had with him. She was just as freaked out as I was and was glad I came inside the station and made sure she got to the car okay. About a week later, I saw on the news that a woman had been assaulted near a gas station. A man attempted to grab her and assumed to kill her. Luckily, she escaped from him, but through the struggle, the man had bitten her very hard on the back of the neck and the woman reported as she escaped from his grip and ran away. The man then screamed saying, all I want is a juicy bite, just one more bite, just before bursting into a mad laughter. I was stunned and I instantly knew the man who attacked that woman and the incident took place at the same gas station. I told Claire and informed the authorities shortly after. From what I know, to this day, that insane man was never apprehended. Be careful with strange men around gas stations. You never know what could happen. The story happened two months ago and takes place in the Netherlands. My name is Kim. I'm a 24 year old waitress and I just finished my shift at the restaurant that I work at. I live in a small apartment complex. After a long stressful week, I just wanted to have a relaxing Friday night. I took a bath, played some Black Ops 4 and then around 7.30 PM, I decided to order a pizza. So I rang Domino's and I heard the phone answer, but there was a slight pause before I heard someone speak. I could just make out some muffled breathing. I said, um, hello? Then right after I spoke, a man then said, Domino's Pizza, can I take your order? Which I thought was strange because why didn't he say that when he picked up the phone? But I brushed it off. I ordered a large pepperoni and sausage pizza with stuffed crust, some garlic bread, and a big bottle of Pepsi, which he replied, for pickup or delivery. I said delivery and gave him my address and he told me it would take around 30 to 40 minutes to arrive. I then told him thank you and he replied with, the pleasure is mine. Then he hung up abruptly. I was just thinking to myself what a strange thing to say and kind of laughed it off thinking maybe he was just joking or something, but still, it weirded me out. About 35 minutes passed until I heard a slow knock on my door. Four knocks to be exact with about two seconds in between each knock. I opened the door to see a large bald man holding my pizza. He then said, Hello young lady, and handed me the pizza and said, That will be 22 euros and 40 cents, which I thought was a very weird thing to say as that's something you usually say to a child. I took the pizza and gave him the money. As I handed him the cash, he kind of grabbed the money where he could also touch my hand and slide his fingers on the palm of my hand, which really creeped me out. As I looked up, he had a big smile on his face and his eyes were bulging. I awkwardly smiled and said to keep the change and then shut the door. I sat down, turned on the TV and started to eat my pizza. About two minutes go by since I got my pizza and then I heard a slow knock on my door. Same as before, four knocks with two seconds in between each knock. I thought to myself, it can't be the pizza guy again, could it? What could he want? I was already creeped out and I didn't want to deal with him again. 
I checked through the peephole and to my surprise, there was no one there. I opened my door and said, Um, hello? Anybody there? I looked left and right down the dingy lit corridor and didn't see anything. This is weird, I thought. Just as I was about to close the door, I looked down to see a bottle of Pepsi and garlic bread. It was from my order. I forgot to take it in with me in the house because I wanted to end my encounter with that freaky bald man as quickly as I could. I carried on eating and watching TV. After I finished my pizza, I got up to throw the cardboard away and take out the trash. I went out my apartment and headed downstairs outside to the big rubbish bin. I glanced across the car park and I noticed a car was parked and there was someone in there just staring at me. I couldn't make out who it was because it was too dark. I entered my apartment again and carried on playing my PlayStation. After a few hours or so, I got tired of playing and decided to go to bed and read my book before getting some sleep. About 15 minutes into reading, I heard a knock on my door. A slow knock. Now I was scared I knew who this was. I didn't get up out of bed. I just tried to ignore it and see if he would go away. He didn't. The knocking continued. I plucked up the courage and got up to look through the peephole. The man was staring right through glass, smiling like he did earlier, but this time with a menacing look on his face and bloodshot eyes. When I saw this, I jumped back and gasped out of fear and shock. He must have heard me because as soon as I made a noise, his knocking turned into pounding, and he started screaming. He was turning my doorknob, trying to break in. I ran to my phone and called the police. The banging stopped shortly after. I thought he might have left because maybe he heard me call the police. I checked the peephole once again, and he wasn't gone. He was standing there, not smiling this time, just staring at the glass hole with a blank expression muttering to himself. The police finally arrived and arrested him. I don't know what happened to that man that night, or why he was doing what he did. I just pray to God that I'll never see him again, and I'll think twice when ordering a pizza. The story happened when I was five years old and takes place in the UK. I'm a male and my name is George. My nan had started to say that her house was haunted and tell my mom that she would hear things in the house. My granddad had passed away a few months before this and as my mom didn't really believe in ghosts or things like that, she thought my nan was lonely since her husband had passed away, so she wouldn't take much notice to what my nan was telling her. Every now and then, my mom, who was a single mother at the time, would have to go to Way for a few days at a time because of her job. So I would just stay over at a friend's house or my cousin's, but my nan was having some trouble. And we guessed she was feeling lonely, but my mom decided that I would stay with her for the few days that my mom would be away. We get to the house and say goodbye to my mom. Later that day, my nan was cooking dinner and I was sat in the front room watching some cartoons and playing with action figures. I then heard footsteps coming from the room above me, which was my nan's bedroom. The floor was creaking. I just thought that my nan had maybe gone upstairs for something. I then got up to go get a coke from the fridge. I walked in the kitchen and I was completely startled when I saw my nan cooking in the kitchen. I thought she was upstairs. She looked at me and said, You okay, sweetie? Dinner will be ready soon. I was confused but just shrugged it off and said okay, got my drink, and carried on watching cartoons, thinking maybe it was just the wind or the house making noise or something. Some time passed after eating dinner. It was soon time for me to get ready for bed, so I headed upstairs to brush my teeth and put my PJs on. As I walked past my nan's bedroom after getting ready to head back downstairs, I heard a sort of bang coming from inside. I stopped and turned to face the slightly ajar door and I saw that the room was dark. Nan was definitely not in there. She was downstairs, so I wondered what could have made the noise. I nervously opened the door very slowly and looked inside the dark room. From what I could make out from the hallway light shining through it, it was empty and nobody was in there. I switched on the light and walked in to check the room. I saw that a picture frame had fallen on the floor from her vanity, and I walked over to pick it up, and the more I entered the room, I felt the cold type of cold that you don't feel often. The type of cold where it feels like there's a presence with you. I got to the picture frame and picked it up. It was my granddad. I looked at it for a moment, thinking how much I miss him. I then placed the picture back on the vanity, and just as I did that, something happened. Something that I'll never forget. I turned towards her walk-in cupboard that was next to her vanity, and the door started slowly opening. 
I froze in complete fear and my eyes were wide open. I watched as the door was slowly opening and a hand appeared around the door. I started breathing heavily and then following the hand was a face appearing around the door. A pale white face with blue eyes cold as ice looking straight through me. I screamed and started crying running out of the room and downstairs straight into my nan's arms. I couldn't get my words out as I was so scared and upset. I eventually calmed down and explained to my nan what I saw. She held me and just looked up at the ceiling. She told me it's okay and that she's here now. We slept downstairs in the front room that night. As you can imagine, I didn't get much sleep. I just laid there cuddling with my nan on the sofa bed, just staring up at the ceiling, hearing the upstairs floor creak all night long. It's like my nan knew what I saw because she was looking up with me. The next day, my mom came to pick me up. Her work trip had finished a day earlier, so I got up to go home and I didn't have to stay at my nan's house another night. Looking back now, I wish I had stayed with my nan. She must have been terrified being there all on her own, but I was too young and afraid to think like that. Right before we left, my nan had told me something. She told me that everything will be okay and she loves me. That was the last time I saw her and spoke to her. She died three weeks later. I never told anyone about what I experienced until today. I'm 23 now, and looking back, I think my nan knew what was going to happen to her. I truly believe that whatever that thing was in that house is responsible for her passing. I just pray to God it wasn't. To preface this story, I want to give some context. I didn't have a car for most of the time I was in high school, not getting one until my senior year. That left me either having to walk where I wanted to go, get someone to drive me, or just not go where I want to at all. This left me homebound during a lot of my free time, since a lot of the time my siblings didn't want to give me a ride to places I could go and chill. Though the neighborhood that I lived in in itself was considered affluent, it was located in the south part of town and was and still is pretty seedy. This included the closest gas station to my house, which when walking to it, it was about an hour away. I did and still do have a large appetite, so whenever I had some extra cash, I would always walk there at night to grab some snacks. Admittedly, walking there in the dead of night wasn't a good idea, especially with the type of people who hung out around the area, but I felt like it was my only option. I'm rather overweight and I have been all my life, which led to my father being very controlling of my diet and he would always be passive aggressively judgmental of whatever I ate. This led me into a mentality of hiding my eating habits, including getting food late at night to eat, and including walking to that gas station. This was another one of those nights, and I was about a quarter of the way there. Being the nervous and paranoid person I am, I had been checking over my shoulder and keeping my eyes peeled on my general area because the last thing I wanted to happen was get jumped at the dead of night. At this point in my walk, I was nearing the homeless shelter that was on the route to the gas station. On the side of the building facing the road, there's a garbage retainer walled off with a wooden fence. You can smell it right before you see it, and on the hot southern summer night, I could smell it hard. I increased my speed out of instinct to get out of the building's vicinity because of that, before my eyes caught him. There was a guy leaning against the fence that walled off the garbage retainer. It took a bit more of staring as I walked by to realize what he was doing. He was jacking off, fully blown in view of anyone walking past. Though it freaked me out, I can't say I was surprised. A lot of drug addicts and mentally ill people who couldn't afford proper help congregated this area, and I had figured that this guy was just another one of those people. Either way, I increased my already quick pace to get out of the area. I wish that that was the end of this, but unfortunately it wasn't. The guy still going at it down there managed to get up and began following me. I was on the verge of tears at this point, scared that he was going to catch up to me and do God knows what to me. I increased how fast I was going even more, fully prepared to run at the drop of the hat if the guy did, though I knew in the back of my mind if he really wanted to, he could probably catch up to me pretty easily due to how unathletic I was. But he kept his distance, continuing to follow me until I finally managed to reach the gas station. The amount of joy and relief that I felt at seeing it, I can't manage to properly describe. I dashed in there and alerted the attendant to what was going on, asking if I could linger in there for a bit. She was more than happy to oblige and asked if I wanted to call the police, but stupidly, I said no. I didn't want my dad finding out what I had been doing, and honestly, at that point I just wanted to get back to the safety of my house and not deal with the cops. 
After waiting around for a bit, I checked outside and didn't see the guy who had followed me. I decided that it was as good of time as ever, so I went back inside, got what I came for, and called a friend to have on the phone with me as I walked back home. Thankfully, the guy who had followed me was nowhere to be found on my way back, and I got back to my place in one piece. This didn't end my night crawls, but I didn't leave to go to the gas station for a while, and definitely not without letting a friend know where I was going. This experience isn't of mine, but of my mother. She's been a truck driver for 26 years. Yes, a very long time. She is the only female driver at her company. Being a female driver, she's experienced a lot of odd and very weird things on the road and truck stops that she's been on. She has always told me that she feels unsafe at a truck stop and she would not get out of her cab, meaning she would not even try to take a bathroom break at a truck stop. While my mom was driving down the road in Mason City, Iowa late at night with a load on a four-way road, there was a dark Ford truck driving beside her. He sped up a little and she noticed there was a blue tarp over the back and the back hatch was down. He had hit a bump somewhere in the road and to her surprise, she saw what looked like an arm flop out from under the tarp and was dangling there. The person must have noticed this and pulled over to an empty parking lot. My mother stopped at the stop sign staring. She hurried and dialed 911. The man had noticed that she had seen this as he looked her in the eyes and flopped the arm back under the tarp and put the back hatch up. The man wasn't too tall. He had dark hair, white skin, and dark clothes. My mother told the police the color of the truck and license plate number and location. She thanked he noticed her because he started to follow her truck. As she was telling me this story, in the back of my mind, I was thinking she could have just run him over if she needed to. My mother said that she had a very bad gut feeling about him following her, and she kept driving through the town. She locked her doors in case she needed to stop somewhere. The guy's truck suddenly disappeared by turning into a different road. She sighed in relief. When my mother got home the next day, which was on a Friday, I was in my high school years, and she was telling her girlfriend at the time the story. But the news came up and reported that a news lady had vanished and never came to work. My mother felt very cold and was thinking that she might have seen her body, or at least part of it, and her killer. But unfortunately, the police never called back about the driver. They never found the lady's body either. Last night, my friends, my crush, and I agreed to meet at my favorite bar after work. I was a bit early since I got to leave work 30 minutes early, so I went inside and ordered a beer for myself. There was this huge muscular guy with a long ponytail sitting at the bar and the seat next to him was empty. He offered me to sit down, so I did. We had some small talk and he seemed nice enough. Just asked me why I'm all alone and kept talking about how I looked so uneasy and nervous and that I should relax. It was weird, but he had an almost empty bottle of vodka in front of him so I really didn't think anything of it. My friends finally arrived just as I finished my beer and we went to sit at a table. I had three more bottles of beer and we were having a great time. Whenever I went to the toilet, that guy from the bar was there asking me if I was okay. That was pretty strange, but at the time I just felt a little tipsy and everything was all right. At some point I started to feel sick, so I went outside to have a cigarette and get some cold air. The guy followed me outside and asked if I was alright yet again. I was starting to get weirded out at that point. The bar was super full but he really seemed to watch me all night long. I went back inside, ordered a glass of water and I told my friends that I wasn't feeling well and I would be going home. Every single one of them offered to bring me home which I'm so grateful for looking back. I took a sip of water and then it all just hit me. I ran outside and threw up. I could barely stand up all of a sudden, so I decided to sit down on a staircase and kept throwing up. My friends found me a few minutes later, and they kept arguing about whether they should take me to a taxi or carry me home. Then the guy from the bar showed up. He kept saying that he lives just down the street and that I could sleep on his couch. My coworker, who's basically like an older brother to me, got really pissed and told the guy to screw off. They forced me to stand up, which was almost impossible at that point, and somehow dragged me to my friend's place where I went to sleep, hugging a bucket and feeling like I was going to die any second. The next morning, I wasn't able to stand for hours. When I did, it resulted in instant vomiting. 
It was 1 p.m. when I finally managed to go to the train station, get something to eat and drink, and head home. I'm still shaking and sweating, and everything looks blurry. I'm almost 100% certain that guy roofied my drink. Watch your back when you go to bars, and most importantly, always watch your drink. There can always be some creep there ready to roofie it and take advantage of you. About four years ago, I worked at a pizza restaurant where the bar only served beer and wine. The staff was all very close to one another and a lot of us lived together and carpooled. Well, one Friday night I was working with two of my best friends and one of their boyfriends. About an hour before we closed, this younger guy walks in and sits at the bar. My friend serves him one beer and a slice of pizza. They talked pretty consistently throughout the rest of the night since he was the only one sitting at the bar. Nothing flirty, just friendly conversation. He was a really nice guy and acted completely sober when he came in. After about two short beers, he totally flipped a switch. All of a sudden, it was like he was hammered. We were all so confused because, well, he only had two beers. My friend gave him his check and asked him if she could call him a cab so he could get home safely. He declines and says a friend would be there soon to pick him up. He pays his bill and she grabs him a water to go. About 30 minutes later, he was still there and we were getting ready to leave. We asked him if his friend was going to be there soon because we needed to lock up. He replied that he'd be there in a few minutes. We asked him if he'd wait on the bench outside so we could go home. He agreed and he went outside and sat by the front door. We finished closing up the restaurant and bar and we all headed out for the night. After locking up, he started asking my friend who served him very odd and personal questions. She said she didn't feel comfortable answering and we all started to walk to our cars. I rode with my roommate and her boyfriend, but our other friend rode alone. He followed us to our car and the boyfriend turned around and said, what do you want? And he asked if he could have some of my friend's water, which she gave to him and kept walking. She was so freaked out and she ran to her car, got in and locked the doors. We were already in our car when she was about to drive away, but he ran in front of her car and screamed that she needed to take him home with her. She yelled back that if he didn't move, she would hit him with her car. He then flung himself onto her car and took something out of his pocket and repeatedly hit her window. My friend's boyfriend started rushing over there and pulled him off of her car. After he did that, she managed to drive away. The guy then rolled over onto the sidewalk and started to crawl away. We drove off right after this and haven't seen him since. Last Friday, after a particularly difficult week at work, I wanted to meet up with my friends at a local wine bar slash art house that we're regulars at. My poetry was actually debuted there. I'm good friends with the owner. I texted my friends during the day and we're great to go on. I work close to the wine bar so I headed there straight after work. Arriving before my friends, I decide to order a glass of wine. I greet the owner who's behind the bar and there's an older man there who seemed to be excited to have a conversation but I decided to cut it short and take it out onto the patio to relax. It's pretty quiet at the bar, but by the time my friends arrive, 45 minutes to one hour later, it gets busy. They order their drinks and I get a second one. We find a spot outside of the patio to catch up. A few of their friends join us and we're all chatting a group of guys who try to come up and hit on us. They start saying things about how they like the way we look. We shake them off politely and keep chatting. My boyfriend sends me a text and says he would be by in a few minutes to drop something off. He knows the owner. My boyfriend pulls up, drops the item off, and I walk him to his car and give him a kiss goodbye. Back to my friends. They're chatting and having a good time and the group of guys comes up to see us again. We shake them off yet again. I finish my second drink and one of my friends asks if I want to go to the side of the building to smoke a bit. I was down so we went to the side. Continuing our chatting, my friend was rolling her joint, and this is when I started to feel strange. Like I started to feel lightheaded and have hot flashes. I remember turning my head to look out towards the road, and everything seemed very far away. And then, everything went black. I remember bits and pieces of trying to get to the car and my legs not working. My friends trying to hold me up. The next thing I remember is sitting on my couch crying with my friend. She tells me that she called my boyfriend to come stay with me and they think someone spiked my drink. 
I noticed that my legs are scraped and bleeding and I don't remember falling. My boyfriend stayed with me all night long. I remember bits and pieces of it, more crying confusion and being extremely uncomfortable. Yes, I'm happy and grateful that my friends were there to notice me and get me to safety, but it's greatly affected the way I feel. I don't feel safe anywhere now. I feel uneasy. This may be because I've prided myself on being able to take care of myself and my ability to protect myself. This is a place I felt shame. I have some sleep issues and anxiety since this happened. My boyfriend wants to bring me back once I'm ready so I can have some good memories there and experience it in a good way again. I don't really know why I'm writing this other than attempt to get a sense of relief. I know I'm okay and that it could have ended up a lot worse, but still, it's just hard to let go and get past it. This was back in the 1990s. I was a single mom and I picked up a Saturday night bartending job at a place that was off the highway on a frontage road, not immediately close to anything but in between some pretty large towns in the affluent suburbs north of Chicago. This place was pretty hopping after work hours but sadly not on Saturday nights and I'd often find myself alone or with only a handful of customers. This particular night was dark, rainy and a thunderstorm was raging outside. In walks this rugged, handsome man, windswept blonde hair, crystal blue eyes, nice build, and he sits at the bar. It's just the two of us, and I walk over to take his drink order. He orders I make the drink, and he had put 225 on the bar. I hand him the drink, and I realize he didn't give me enough money, so I tell him I need another quarter. The drink is 250. Mind you, we're alone in this good-sized bar. It's a dark night, and thunder and lightning are raging outside. It's not very close to any other businesses that I could run to or where other people might be. And he looks at me straight in the eye and calmly says, I'm Satan. Tell me what you really want. I can give you anything you want. What is it that you really want? At this point, I'm shaking in my shoes. I'm not really sure how I even mustered up a response. And I look at him back and say, I want another quarter for your drink and I want you to stop being scary. He gave me the quarter, downed his drink and left. I had to close up alone, and believe me, I was on edge until the following morning. I didn't work there much longer after that. Seeing Satan once was more than enough for me. So let's start with some background. I'm a male, and I've been in college for a few years now. A group of people from my program would always go to this dive bar on our college's street every Thursday night. They did karaoke, so it was a fun way for us to all blow off steam once a week. Unfortunately, as the school year went on, the bar got sketchier and sketchier, until one day this group of guys started showing up. They weren't the cleanest, friendliest, or even the soberest of people, frequently hitting on some of my friends and making everyone extremely uncomfortable. One time one of the guys walked up to my friend and flat out asked in the middle of our conversation if we wanted any cocaine. Anyway, now that some background is out of the way, on this particular night we decided to stay until last call, and I heard some of those weird guys saying how they wanted some college nookie that night. Concerned for my friends who weren't dressed the most PG of the group, I asked a couple of my boys to stick back with me to make sure they got in their Uber safely. They of course agreed because they're bros and they were concerned as well. So we chilled at a table near the door and waited until they came out of the bathroom half an hour after last call. And now we see that they call their Uber and get in it safe. Once they drive off, my buddies and I start walking back to the residence. So it's just the three of us, me and my two friends, walking back at 2.40 in the morning. We get about five minutes away from the bar when I hear the scuffling of shoes behind us. I turn around and see one of the shorter guys walking a little ways behind us very quickly. It was pretty late and I was tired, so I didn't make anything of it. Big mistake. Five more minutes pass and I hear someone say, Hey, wait up, from behind us. It's one of those guys and he has a taller friend with him now. Immediately I get this horrible feeling in my gut. We ignore them but we start walking faster but the shorter guy squeezes between my friend and me and stops dead in front of me. I think to myself, Crap, this is where I die. Rest in peace me, nice knowing you guys. The bigger guy looks at us, almost sizing us up, and then says, You boys know there's a tax for walking out here so late, right? 
We all then look at each other with a mix of annoyance and confusion. The little guy chimes in with, $30 each. Now, give it. Now, with us being poor college students, we don't carry cash on us, and we made that known. Give us your wallets then, the big guy said. We lied through our teeth, saying we didn't have those on us either. So, big guy puts his hands on my buddy's shoulders and says while pointing down to a very poorly lit street, Well, then I guess you don't mind if we pat you guys down right over here, do ya? You're not carrying your wallets, so there's nothing to worry about, right? Of course I mind, you freaking weirdo. Leave us alone. My buddy had the same idea. He shoved the guy's hands off his shoulders and then said, Nope, I'm not gonna do that. Then the big guy out of nowhere grabs my buddy by the throat and punches him square in the jaw. My other buddy then tackles the big guy off of him while the little guy jumps on his back. I'm now standing there basically frozen and having never been in a fight before. My buddy realizes this and then turns to me and shouts for me to run. So I start to run away. I look back and see that my friends are not too far behind. The big guy yells, Get back here! Obviously, we had no intention of returning to them, so we just sprinted, eventually losing them. My buddy calls the cops, and they meet us back at the residence. We give them our statements, and I take the officers to the bar and where we got attacked. They say they'll let us know if they find them. One of our other friends, who just so happened to be up at the time, came and invited us up to his room for some celebratory whiskey, because the only reason we stayed behind and got mugged was because we wanted to protect our lady friends from those guys. It's been a couple of months, and I haven't heard anything from the cops, but needless to say, we definitely had to find a new spot for our Thursday night outings. For the record, I'm a 28-year-old male. And this happened just last year in a major southern U.S. city. My best friend Laura and I took advantage of an extended weekend to visit several of our close friends whom all moved to said city. For clarity, their names are Jacob, Jessica, Bailey, and Tim. Conveniently, they all live in the same house, which is important. We had no shortage of fun and eventful moments Thursday and Friday, but Saturday night is where it all kicks off. We went to this arcade bar that had nearly every arcade game in history, plus all the new fighting games converted to arcade style. Jacob and I have a pretty mean geek streak, so this was pure bliss for us. Getting to dominate in Tekken, Injustice, TMNT, more Tekken, etc. Lauren was also having a blast with us, but Bailey and Jessica were struggling to find enjoyment. Bless their hearts. Eventually, they decided to grab an Uber to their favorite country slash line dancing bar. I'd been before and country is just not my thing, so I stuck to the bar arcade. Eventually, Lauren decided to take an Uber to the country bar as well, as she'd never been and was curious. Planned to fully regroup at the country bar when the bar arcade closed, we set up a group text and told Jessica and Bailey that Lauren was coming to meet her at the front, since it is a massive place. And off she went. I don't really remember how much time had passed. But I received a text from Loring telling me she couldn't find Bailey anywhere and that Jessica had already gone home. Jacob and I decided to drive over there, pick up Warren, and head home. We figured Bailey was with the guy that she was interested in at the time, hence her radio silence. After the 20-ish minute drive to the bar, I called Warren and told her we were out front, only for her to respond with, It's okay, I'm going to stay a while longer. Are you sure you want to stay? I asked. Yes, she said plainly. With no other option, I asked that she let us know when she heads back and to be safe. Jacob and I drove back to the house. Before I go any further, I need to describe the layout of this house. It's a traditional two-bedroom house with the office room having been converted for an extra bedroom. This house also had no curtains or blinds on any windows. There's two massive windows in the living room looking out to the main road and door windows in the former office room. In the backyard, there's a garage that has its own mini house attached to it. This is where Jacob lives, and I slept there for the weekend. Once we got home, we had one or two more drinks, and at around 2.30 a.m., I got a text from Lauren saying she was on her way back. With that, I went to the futon and passed out. I was jolted awake to the sound of the door being burst open and somebody shouting at us. It was Bailey. She was shouting at us, frantically demanding to know where Lauren was. My watch read 4.30 and I felt really uneasy in my stomach. It took Jacob and me about 15 minutes to get home, so where the heck was she? She hadn't answered or returned any of Bailey's calls. Jacob was so drunk that he couldn't stay awake, so it was on Bailey and me to try and find her. I called Lauren and she luckily picked up. 
Having known her for 10 years, I could tell she was both highly intoxicated and scared, trying not to show it as best she could. This in turn scared me even more. Asking obviously where the heck she was and if she was okay, she aggravatedly responded that she's okay and in an Uber headed to the house. ETA 15 minutes. I couldn't get any more information from her. She said she needed to hang up so she could use her GPS to get home and hung up. Why would she need to use GPS if she has an Uber? 15 minutes on the dot and no sign of Warren arriving. I was ready to turn this whole town upside down but I called one more time. She picks up, sounding just as agitated, but this time I hear more than one voice on the other line before they all hush. As I start asking her all the details of the Uber car, the driver, and the passengers, she tells me that it's a red Toyota sedan and she's three minutes out, hanging up the phone once again abruptly. Not taking any chances, I quickly put on a shirt and pants, grab my two knives, ready for a potential mess with whomever these guys might be, and waited on the front porch. Bailey was ready to call 911 in the event things went south. Roughly three minutes later, a vehicle slowed towards our driveway. A white pickup truck. The passenger door opens and out walks Lauren, exiting with haste and not bothering to close the door or look back. She didn't say a word to the driver. I could quickly see three other dudes in the truck, but couldn't get any specifics before one of them closed the door. As we both rushed to Lauren's side to help her get in, she was dead silent and slightly stumbling hastily to the house. After what she told us, I have plenty of reason to believe that these guys were traffickers. She was all alone and lost in the bar when a guy came up and asked her to dance. When she agreed, another guy came and then grabbed her phone and wallet with the excuse that it'll make dancing easier. How easy it'd be to check her ID and see that she's not from the state and appeared to be on her own. Plus, they could use that as a means to keep her from leaving. They took her to a separate room where a bunch of guys had her drink a crap load of booze. She'd be way too intoxicated to drive and she wouldn't look drugged, making it easy to slip her past security under the guise of she's too drunk to drive. We'll take her home. They said they knew the address to which she wanted to go but knew a shortcut. Lauren's too smart to fall for that which is why she pulled up her GPS. Once I called, they must have realized that people were already looking for her. After she told us all of this in the living room, we noticed that the truck had not moved, only turned its headlights off. Once I turned the lights off, they finally left. No couch for tonight. She was definitely sharing a bed with someone that night. We made sure that every single door and window was locked and to call us, and to call us or 911 if anything went bump in the night. I went back to the garage house only to find the front door not properly locked. Damn it. The only brilliant idea I had was to place a bunch of empty cans from the weekend against the door so we could hear if the door even slightly opened. By this point it was about 5 in the morning, still no sun, knife went under my pillow, and I went back to sleep. I was pretty confident that the ordeal had passed but I was pretty creeped out at the thought that these are likely dangerous people and they know where my friends live now. Not even an hour later, I woke again to a sound by the door. Sure enough, it was the sound of beer cans sliding along the tile floor, followed by the door quickly but quietly being shut. Knife in my hand and ready to piss a river, I was confronted with two immediate choices. Check the window if anyone was outside fleeing, or check the interior for any intruders. I chose the latter, stupidly forgetting to call my friends or 911. I was tired and scared. Jacob still hadn't budged from his bed and I couldn't find the strength to open my mouth. I just kept checking every room and corner underneath Jacob's bed and the garage. If the situation weren't already terrifying, that garage at night would be a phenomenal prop for any scary movie. After concluding that Jacob and I were the only ones in the house, I checked the beer cans on the floor. It wasn't my imagination or a dream. The beer cans had been pushed by the door. Someone had just tried to get in. I looked out the window for the first time and found nothing out of the ordinary, but I gave whomever came snooping plenty of time to run or hide as I checked inside. Thanking only for the safety of my friends inside the main house, I made yet another stupid decision to step outside and check the perimeter. It was still incredibly dark out. The only light available was by a dim backyard light that they perpetually kept on, along with my flashlight. There were no cars at this time of night, no dogs barking and I can't remember hearing any birds or insects. The silence was unholy. I was waiting to hear footsteps or breathing or to see someone at every turn of my flashlight, 
Nobody was in the backyard, so I checked the windows and doors for any signs of disturbance. I could see directly into the office bedroom, which made me feel sick at the thought of someone with ill intentions peering in to see who was sleeping in that room. Fortunately, my search was anticlimactic, as I didn't find any sign of anyone sticking around. Regardless, I rushed into the garage house, relieved myself, rearranged the beer cans in case someone were here to try again, and I stayed awake and alert until the adrenaline sent me to sleep. My watch read 11.30ish when I woke up, and as far as I know, nothing further happened. I updated a rather hungover Jacob about what went down less than 12 hours ago, to which he simply responded, Dang. I find it rather funny given how high-strung I was handling the situation. I really didn't want to, but I asked everyone if they tried to get into the garage house after Lauren was back home. And of course, nobody said they did. I only told Jacob about my personal ordeal in hopes that he would get the lock fixed. I didn't want to freak anyone else out more than they already were. Two months later, when Lauren and I came back to see them, I told them everything. I was most pleased to see that Jacob's lock had been fixed and there are now blinds on nearly every window. Lessons learned. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you have your own personal scary story, be sure to submit that to my subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash southerncannibal or to my email at southerncannibal at gmail.com. I'm always looking for new stories. And before we bring this video to a close, I just want to shout out all of my $5 or more patrons, as well as my $3 or more patrons featured on screen. Shout out to Babe Lincoln, Beth A, Kate E, Celeste S, Ellie S, Emily W, Heather B, Howard R, Jacqueline W, Jazzy G, Jonathan C, Lori J, Matthew B, Michael G, Random Randy, Steph L, Tammy S, and Terry H. Thank all of you so much for supporting me on Patreon. I really appreciate it more than you know. And if any of you would like to join these awesome people and also become a patron, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash southerncannibal. Thank you everyone, and have a good one, and remember to always stay home.